All right, this should work. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another live Q&A. My name is Cedric. Thank you so much for joining me. If you've watched this podcast or this live Q&A, you know that sometimes I'm a few minutes late. I really, really apologize. I was just in a consult with another client talking about their invitation to apply for Express Entry. So as you guys know, the Express Entry draws have restarted after approximately six weeks of, of not happening. And uh, I always love the Q&As to start with Express Entry. And we, we kind of talk about kind of an overview of, you know, some of the things that are happening in Express Entry. And then we talk about a little bit more uh, in detail. Uh-oh, the screen is not connected. I honestly, guys, I just ran <laughs> straight from the last consult. It took a little bit longer straight to here. So I appreciate your patience. I just want to let you guys know that I'm here and and we're still doing this live Q&A. So I want to get on as quickly as possible. There we go. So Express Century Rounds of Invitation. The last draw was last weekend, uh, sorry, last week on Wednesday. And we can see here that the draw is 5,500. So as we talked about for Express Century, just very briefly for people who are just joining us, the way it works is that the, Can the Canadian government wants you to immigrate to Canada. And the way they do so is that they take like your education, your your uh, your employ your your employment experience, your language scores, and they give you a score, and they give you a score, and the top individuals, right, the top scoring individuals, about every two weeks get what's called an invitation to apply. They land in Canada, they get permanent residency from the moment they enter Canada, which means they can study, like if they were a PR Canadian for for less costs in some provinces they have access to all the, all the health care right as well and they're, they're contributing to canadian society and there's some residency obligations and whatnot but this is a flagship way it's a super great way to immigrate to canada right if you have the score you get the invitation you come to canada now how do we determine right who is going to get an invitation to apply and i think it's so <laughs> thanks guys nice suit yeah thanks I, I think it's so important that we talk about the crs calculator and this is for those people who might be a little bit more advanced or even people who are interested in coming to Canada. We can take a look here. It's not showing up really well, but here are all the points that you get, right? So depending on your age, you get points for age. If you have a spouse, if you don't have a spouse, or if you have a spouse, you get different type of points. These are the maximum amount of points. Um, and, you know, talk about knock groups and tiers and, and, and education inside Canada and work experience inside Canada. But what I do want to get to guys, is the CRS calculator. And the reason why is, I think I just wanna talk about, um, about how to improve someone's CRS score realistically, right? And we're talking about the legit way of doing it. Don't pay for a job offer. Don't pay for an LMIA. It's completely, completely illegal. Um, it might have worked for someone that you know. You might have heard it about it. Well, guess what? The Canadian government does audit, right, people? They do catch, they do catch liars. They do catch people who commit fraud some cases in three months, some cases in two, three years. And guess what? When they catch somebody, they're going to find out maybe hundreds or thousands of other applicants that that person fraudulently helped with or fraudulently did. And it could actually end up in getting your permanent residency revoked or even, you know, your study or work permit revoked. So super, super serious. And obviously if you commit fraud or something, a misrepresentation, you could be inadmissible to Canada for five years. And I know I talked about it uh, 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 on the last live Q&A, but under here, legal help, we have all these links on misrepresentation, how to avoid a misrepresentation. And for those who want to do their own research on what is a misrepresentation, take a look at this. This is, uh, here we're talking about, you know, an overview in case law, what are inadmissibilities? What are the specific sections in the law that talk about, um, you know, the inadmissibility, right? So directly or indirectly misrepresenting or withholding material facts relating to relevant matter that induces or could induce, could, could induce an error in the administration of the act. So take a look at some case law talking about, you know, what applicants have to do, right? Uh, how, so section 40 here, they're talking about misrepresentation. Again, these are really for DYIers, people who want to know, you know, what are misrepresentations and do their own research. Take a look at our website, Holf Immigration Law, links in the comment below, obviously. All right, but let's head back to our CRS score calculator because I think this is such like a common question. Now that we're getting close to the 480s or 490s in terms of CRS score, let's talk about ways that we can 
increase our CRS score. Like legit ways in three to six months, your CRS score is gonna go up. All right, so let's start with, we're gonna talk about the situation of being married. And here we've already talked about how if you're married, they calculate your points differently. So if you're married, they're gonna put 40 points, go to your spouse, uh, and then you can get those 40 points back. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. And super important, right? So we're gonna answer this question here. We're gonna say no. And then is the spouse or common law partner gonna come with you to Canada? So here they're asking, are they accompanying or not? And uh, you know, you can't you can't just decide that your spouse or your children are not gonna be accompanying to have a higher score. If they're accompanying, right? They're like if you live together and you have a life together, they're gonna to be accompanying you to Canada. Obviously, some some scenarios where you know children or custody or old parents make it that the spouse is not going to be accompanying you, but I would recommend to explain that in a letter of explanation. So in this case, you're married and your common law partner or spouse is coming with you. All right, so how old are you? So this scenario, we're going to put the age of 32. So we lost a few points, but because it's the, after 29 you lose points, we're going to go at 32. And then what is your level of education? I see guys, so many great questions uh, coming in, people receiving ITAs, CC applications, Good morning from Jamaica. Good morning from uh, from all around the world. I'll get to those in just a moment, but I do want to talk about um, I do want to talk about how to really improve our CRS score. What is your level of education? So here we're gonna put oh you can't see, but here we're gonna put bachelor's degree. And no, you never come to Canada, and your language tests uh, super super important. So here we're gonna put IELTS, and we're gonna put ourselves uh, in the the six, and or you know what we're gonna put ourselves at six point fives. Um, all right, so here we have one of them is going to be a seven, but we know that if we take a look at the CLB IELTS score, we know that um, the, the IELTS, right, 6.5 is going to give us, 7.5 is going to give us the equivalent of eight. And then here we have the nine and the 10, right? So we're going to put 6.5 for most of the things, right? Let's go back to our example here. And then you don't speak French you've worked, you don't have any work experience inside Canada, right? Here you have uh, three years or more foreign work experience. And here we have, um, we don't have a certificate. We don't have a, a, a job offer, not a nomination. You don't have family inside Canada. Your spouse hasn't done their ECA, their educational credential assessment, right? So we can only do this if they've done their educational credential assessment. And then here we're gonna talk about work experience. Canadian work experience. Here they're not asking about foreign work experience for the spouse, only Canadian. And then here we're going to put no language test. So let's take a look at our score here, and we get a score of 324. So it's pretty low, right? And it's not going to cut it. Express entry right now is about 480, 490 is what we expect over the next month or two. And, and it, it might stabilize at around the 470s, right? We don't really know, but pre COVID it was about, yeah, 460, 470. So um, we can calculate how many weeks, how many people they take per week and kind of look at a score, but new people are always joining the pool. All right, so how do we improve this? Well, the first thing that you could do is, well, your spouse can actually go ahead and do their ECA. So go at the, get an ECA, there's, there's a few, if you look at IRCC ECA, there's a few providers, but get your ECA to be able to claim points and also do your language tests, right? Spouses sometimes don't do language tests. It's, it's not super important. Some people have great CRS score. Some people don't, um, but get your spouse to also get a language test. So the spouse, here your spouse had did their ECA. They've also done their language score and now our score went up just a little bit to 344. But here is where you could get even more points. We talked about the CLB, right? So CLB eight, so CLB seven, you get some what's called you know transferability skills like bonus points. But CLB nine is hard to get, but it's really going to be a gold standard in terms of uh, terms of the points here. So you could realistically improve if you study hard for the next three to six months, right? Going from a CLB seven eight to a nine is somewhat realistic, and we calculate the score, we're going to see how it's going to jump up, right? to 408. So it went from 320, your spouse has done their English test, they've done their educational tests, and now we're at 408 and you've studied more English. So it's still too low, right? So at this stage, another thing you look at if you're still too low, so the CLB8 here, this can actually change a lot, right? So if we, if for example, you have one year of a Canadian degree, right? So if you have studied inside Canada, which is obviously not the case, but if you, if you did study inside Canada, 
in, in my in my scenario, the CLB9 is going to give you uh, official language. It's going to give you uh, bonus points, which are really going to be important. And with your Canadian education, you're also going to you're also going to where's the Canadian where's the education? It's a spouse level of education. You're also going to going to go up. Right. So the education is going to be super important. Uh, but in this scenario here, we have. Um, it's 10 years. How many skilled workers do you have? Can work experience. Sorry, I'm just trying to change it here to the degree. Here we're going to say no. So if your CRS score is still too low, you can look at provincial nominees, right? You can also look to going inside your country and looking at possibly getting a master's degree. So going back to school for a year or two. And in our scenario now, if we go ahead and calculate our score, so in the scenario with um, with getting a master, so improving your language scores over three to six months, getting a master's over the next eight months, we're going to be at 447. Um, here, then, then, then it's getting tough in terms of improving scores. We could talk about, you know, your spouse improving the language scores. We could talk about getting a study permit and studying inside Canada, getting clean work experience. But all these are really far. And maybe, maybe I could have given myself a better scenario. But in reality, sometimes someone might sit at 420, and by the time they do the language test, right, and they get their spouse to do their own language test, then they find themselves as at around 470 or 480, which could be the whole difference between getting an ITA or not getting an ITA. But I just want to talk about kind of realistic ways to improve a CRS score before we talked about today. And right, if you're married, get your spouse to the ECA, get your spouse to possibly improve your lang their language scores. If your language scores, right, we really want to aim for everything, at least at everything to be a seven, right? So if one of, if you're underneath this, right, it's not going to be good. And if you can, really the gold standard is going to be to get that CLB nine, or if possible, right, get that CLB level 10, because you get even more points once we talk about getting that CLB level 10. Obviously, it's, it's easier said than done. But in my scenario, if you had the CLB level 10, you're going to see here that the official language in education went up, right? Before it was 25, now it was 50. We also get more points here for the first language. And in this scenario here, we're getting to 460. So we're getting much closer to that target of 470, 480, right? Um, but I just want to emphasize like language is so, so important. People usually don't realize that, you, that, you know, if you have all everything a nine or everything a 10, it really, really gives you a good score. If, for example, you have seven, seven, 7.57, you might want to redo your language test to really get everything nines, because that's where you get a lot of, of bonus points. If you want to call them bonus points, but they're, they're not bonus points, they're called transferability points, as we took a look in the CRS calculator, right? Transferability skill factors. This is where you can get quite a bit of points. Um, but this also shows right how, you know, if you don't speak French, if you're outside Canada, it's really competitive right now. And the whole difference could, could be with your age, right? If we go ahead and do the exact same scenario, right? You have a master's degree, you're 29 years old, you have three years of experience, you speak a CLB level 10, and you're married, right? We could The score here is 474. It's extremely competitive. If we do the same scenario, but we put you as single, right? It's going to recalculate. I think we're going to have to redo this. Are we? No. If you put a single, we talk about those 40 points going to your spouse, right? If we do this as single, oh, it's still showing the spouse, but as single, you're going to see here that it's much higher at 501, right? So anyways, I hope this was helpful. I think the CRS calculator, go through it, go through a few options of improving language, right? Your spouse improving their score, going back to school for a year or two to increase your CRS score. It can make the whole difference. Now, a lot of talk about, you know, a lot, a lot of talk about occupation specific draws. Um, so let's go take a look for occupation specific draws. And there's a lot of stuff going out there in terms of what people know, what someone has told them. Uh, but let's take a look at what, what we know, what's official or somewhat official by IRCC. So stay tuned. This is not official. So sorry, this is not, this is not the official way that they're going to be selecting and changing express entry, but this is an official statement by express entry about how they're going to be enhancing express entry through category, category based selection. And this document is super interesting because it's for, it was used for consultation, meaning that they used it to be able to, 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 for lawyers, for applicants, for consultants to go through and actually provide feedback on what are category-based selection, right? What is 
the process for the determining the new, the new categories, what are the proposed priorities and category selections, what they want to do, right? So they want to look at chronic chronic uh, labor shortages. They want to look at selecting based on experience in a particular inaugural occupation. So even if your CRS score is like 350 or 400, but they really need, you know, IT managers in Calgary, you could find yourself, right, getting an invitation to apply. So having an express entry profile, right, as you continue to work towards your goal of coming to Canada is a valid option, especially since we have confirmation from IRCC that they're going to be looking at the actual candidates, right? They're going to be actually looking at the work experience and the tier codes and whatnot. So take a look at this document, right? They might transition international students to permanent residence, right? No more post-graduation work permit. You finish your school, you get PR, right? So it's going to be super interesting. They might do temporary foreign workers to permanent residents, right? This was, you know, the TR to PR, right? People have, you know, keep asking questions about this. But here's the TR to PR, guys. Um, they're exploring, looking at some various industries, right? Some various opportunities. So a lot of talk about occupation-specific draws or category-based draws. Take a look at this document. Let's see what the possible categories are. Let's see what's going on. Mark did a whole live Q&A about this. All right. Now, the, the reason you're here is not just to hear me talk. I could do a video like this. The reason you're here is really to ask questions. So let's get right to it. We have about maybe about 20, 20, 15 to 20 minutes to go through today. So I'll try to get through as many, as many questions. And as usual, I'm just providing... Um, legal information so not legal advice i don't know your specific situation i don't know if what you're telling me you know is completely accurate i don't know and i'm not here to tell you what to do what i'm here to do is actually give you ircc information information that we can all find on the website and i try to actually help you guide you through essentially how um how you can look and find information right so super super important just legal advice this is not legal information uh sorry just legal information <laughs> sorry not legal advice all right, let's get to it. Ravi says, hi, Cedric, internship for Express Entry FSW points, been full-time student, plus three-month full-time paid internship, plus two-year job, same knock, and all in India, typical co-op terms. Does internship add to CRS points? Good question. So let's talk about eligibility here. So Express Entry, you have to be eligible, and then we can start about calculating your points. Eligibility for federal skilled worker, super important. It has to be one year continuous. So one year continuous full time, right? Or you can have the equivalent of in part time work. So you have X amount of weeks, X amount of hours, just one year full time. Now, big difference between FSW and CC is that FSW um, does allow for student work experience to count if wages were paid. So my question for you would be, were wages paid during your internship? You say here, th plus th been full time student plus three month full time paid internship, right? So if it's if it's paid, it's going to count. Now, well, it's going to count. It should count. I, I don't know if you have the proper reference letters. I don't know about your specific situation, right? But once we meet the eligibility, once we have our one-year continuous work experience, then we talk about CRS points. CRS points are through what's called a ministerial instruction. And we can click here and find out the most recent ministerial instruction and then actually find out here's like, you know, the rules about how they count the points. And we can go down here to foreign uh, work experience and we're going to get right to it at the bottom here. And then you can see here how they give you the points. And you can also see here, oh, this is the combination, combination, the hero foreign work experience. And then you can see here how they calculate the points, right? So there's no restrictions on studying, but there are restrictions in terms of how you were paid, restrictions as to what they count as full-time work and whatnot. But the reason I'm talking about this, I mean, please review it, Ravi, but the, the main reason I'm talking about this is because um, foreign work experience, uh, here they talk about how they calculate it. Where is it? Combination of okay, work and foreign work experience. Uh, trying to find the actual points here. Foreign work experience. Right there, combination of foreign work experience and official languages. So let's take a look here. So there's no, you either have no foreign work experience or you have one or two years or you have at least three years, right? So what I'm trying to tell you here is that in your case, if you have two years, say it's two years and three months, and you add your internship for another three months, you're gonna get two years and six months. It doesn't matter for Express Entry, we're looking at two years 
or at least three years. So in this case, it might not make sense to have to provide in your work history section, in your supporting documents, it might not make sense to provide uh, supporting documents for the internship because it's not gonna give you any points if you already have your two years in the job. Now, how do you calculate the hours, the weeks, was it paid? How do you support this, right? I, I, this is probably the most common reason why applications get rejected is for incomplete reference letters. So make sure you have complete reference letters, look at the completeness check, obviously, Head on, head on over to our website here, Whole of Immigration Law. We, we we work differently, right? So we are immigration lawyers, we're not consultants. I've been to school for at least seven, seven, seven years in law school, right? With a master's degree, two law degrees. And uh, I've been practicing for the last five years. I used to work in immigration for the government of Canada. I've worked for the United Nations, quite a bit, and also at the federal court. So head on, head on over to our website, book a consult here at the bottom. And I'd love to have you to, to actually speak with you and look to see whether or not you meet all the experience you learn here about on on our team uh, about us against Holf Immigration Law. There's links in the comment uh, below. All right, next question. Let's get to it. Uh, can I visit home country for two weeks while my express entry is in progress? Um, so there's no requirement, right, for you to be inside Canada, right, or outside Canada uh, for express entry, right? You can meet the eligibility for one and another. You can be inside Canada, outside Canada. It, it doesn't really matter. But what you do need is a, is a status inside Canada. Right, you can't just stay inside Canada. You still need to have a, a status inside Canada, and you also need to, if you if you need a TRV, a visa to re-enter Canada, or an ETA, you're going to need that as well, right? So there's no hard and fast rules saying that you cannot leave Canada or you must stay inside Canada, but the same rules apply. Namely, you need a status inside Canada, you need documents to return to Canada, right? If you do change address, you have to update them. But uh, so if you have the valid documents to leave, the, the valid documents to return to Canada and continue living in Canada. But if you're under maintained status and you lose your maintained status by leaving Canada, you don't have a TRV to re-enter Canada, then it's going to be a different, uh, different uh, scenario. All right, next question. Next, next question. Let's take a look here. Um, all right, Lima, nice to see you again. In the case someone submits CC application, how long does it take for medicals to show past on profile portal? So typ typically. Uh, and we talked about this in a team meeting recently, but typically it's going to be after your eligibility, right? So typically you're going to go through the eligibility after three months or so, and then about 30 to 60 days later, the medicals are going to get passed, and then we go to security and background checks, and then passport requests or, you know, the confirmation of permanent residence, depending on your, your situation. But I think typically we're talking about 30 to 60 days. Um, Shaher says, hi, Cedric, got ITA. And very confused and profile I claim two jobs, one with one and five years experience, but now I can't prove the job with one year. Can I only claim the one with five years? Um, so it's 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 gonna depend on your eligibility, right? So we talked about FSW and CC, how there's different eligibility for work, right? So the question I have for you is the five year, so like is this is it for CC, is it for FSW? If you don't claim the one year experience, is the other five years still meet the eligibility, right? Foreign work experience maxes out at three years. Right, so if you have five years experience, you might only need to prove those three years. Can work experience maxes out at five years, right? So if it's can work experience, it's gonna be different in the way that we look at, at this issue. And then again, eligibility is super important. Number of hours, very important, but also the NOC. What did you put for the NOC code as your primary NOC? Is the one year experience the primary NOC? So it's, it's hard to tell you exactly what to do without knowing a little bit more about eligibility, without reviewing your situation. Listen, if you want to book a consult, I'd love to talk to you about this and really get this ironed out. But you know, if you have your intended knock in one knock and this five years for another knock, right, then it gets definitely more complicated because you got your ITA with with one knock, but not impossible, but I would just make sure that th that these are things that you want to consider and analyze as you move forward, right? But when we work with our clients for Express Entry, we go through all the supporting documents when we're creating the profile. We go through all these things to avoid these these issues where then you're trying to call your employer after the ITA and you can't reach them or they want to give you the reference letter or you don't have the document. We really go through all of this at the profile creation stage so that when you get the ITA, you essentially just submit your profile and upload the documents, right? My brother just arrived to Canada, he changed his program. The same DLI, does he need to inform IUCC of the change of program? It's 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 gonna, oh, it's a good, it's a really good question. I was looking at this for somebody else uh, recently and let's go take a look here, Unique. Um, was it? 
Um, there's a whole section that they talk about this. Uh, if, your pot, if your application has been approved, you must submit a new study permit with a new letter of acceptance. This is if you're, when you're outside Canada. Um, post, so you're not changing schools, but you're changing program of study. If you change schools and don't tell us, uh, enroll at a DLA, actively studying, contact us. Um, I there could be a condition on your study permit, so I would I will double check it. But um, I believe that if you do change programs within the same school, it, then I don't want to give you wrong advice. Um, change your, uh, right? Are you, are you moving on to the next program of education? That's why you're changing programs. To be completely honest, I think I need a little bit more research on this to give you the proper advice you need. I don't want to say something that, that is not right. I don't know all the answers to every scenario off the top of my head. It's true. And, and, and I will admit it, I, I do, and I still do, need to sometimes confirm some stuff. So I, I don't know off the top of my head to, regarding the situation. And again, I don't know specifically, like, same same school, same level of education. These are all things that I'd want to know before really going um, going going into detail. Um, does receiving pre-rival letter meet PR approved? Uh, it's, it's a good sign. It's, it's a good sign. Uh, but... You know, your, your PR is approved when you get your confirmation of permanent residence signed at the border, right? That's when you become a permanent resident of Canada, right? Confirmation of permanent residence is obviously a great sign that you will get PR if you go to Canada before the expiry of confirmation of permanent residence. Getting a pre-arrival letter is a great sign. Getting a passport request is fantastic as well. So there we have it. All right, Rima says, hi, recently joined in foundation learning assistant for English, additional language of Alberta, under which uh, I will, which gets some living allowance. Does this count as social assistance? So I think you're asking Rima in terms of spousal. And yeah, there we go. I'm afraid because it can get rejected by my spousal. And, and Rima, again, I, I do apologize. I don't know off the top of my head if this specific program the specific assistance is going to count as social assistance. Uh, you're right that if you do receive social assistance and there's a specific definition, we could try to find it. Uh, social assistance, spousal. Let's go take a look if we can find it here. Oh, there we go. They have, they have a whole question about what is considered social assistance. Um, what is considered social assistance, food, shelter, f housing, Health care, what is not considered, so employment insurance, provincial loans, immigration loans, subsidized housing, tax credit, child care, public health, other benefits available to residents, including people who are working. Listen, I, I, I don't know about the specific foundational learning assistance. I don't, also not considered, right? Um, I unfortunately I don't know enough about the program, but do take a look because it, it, it could be important. You might want to look to see how Alberta if they consider the social assistance, right? Get, do some research more on the Alberta side. Again, I don't know how you qualify, but do take a look at this page here about what is considered. Oh, so this is specifically, um, sorry. So this is specifically about social assistance for sponsoring parents and grandparents. Um, so we'd have to do a little bit more research about your specific program and, uh, and your specific case. All right, good morning, Cedric. I want to claim two years for CC, but I spent three months of those outside Canada, half vacation, half remote work, do I need to wait three months more to claim two years of work experience for CEC? So excellent question. Um, and it's, <laughs> I'm getting a lot of really good questions. This one, this one I can definitely guide you in terms of providing more legal information. So there's a whole part about how they assess qualifying work experience for the Canadian experience class. This is gonna be under the operational manual, operational instructions, and guidelines. So here they're gonna talk about how this works and it's already in purple. I've already did a little bit of research here. So it has come up in various cases. So determining the applicant's status, right? You have to be an employee, you can't be a contractor, you can't be self-employed, right? Um, sorry, uh, well, see, so there you go for can work experience. For FSW, different. Let's continue going down here. Employee versus employed, blah, blah, blah. Oh, where's the link? I thought there was a section that talks about, uh, yeah, so there we go. So an, an allowance 
for a reasonable period of time will generally be made in calculating the period of qualifying work experience. For example, two week work period of paid vacation within any 52 week period in which the applicant was engaged in qualifying work experience. Great. However, however, an allowance for normal vacation time during a period of qualifying work experience cannot be used as a substitute or proxy for meeting the in Canada element of the work experience requirement. This is your scenario, right? That is, work experience obtained outside Canada will not be considered as though the applicant had been on a period of vacation in order to be counted as the period of in Canada work experience. So I think that's the answer to your question. Uh, I think this answers it. Well, officers will account for a reasonable period of vacation time. You know, each applicant is considered on its own merit with a final decision based on the review of all the evidence. So excellent question, right? Here it tells us that the you know, the vacation is on a substitute for working abroad. You'd also went for more than like two, three, four weeks, you're there for three months, half vacation, half work, right? So it definitely comes with some risk, right? They're saying here it's gonna be based on its own merits, right? 15 out of 20 immigration officers might not even care, right? No, might not even blink. Or in fact, they, they, they might really care and then five out of 20 don't care, right? So you like, what I'm trying to tell you is that people are gonna appreciate this and look at this in different ways. And I think it's going to be important to, to have a letter of explanation and try to explain it, but it does come with risk. And can you wait three months to submit your express entry application, right? And in, in, in your case, it might not be, right? You might need to be applying right now to get a bridging open work permit and, and you're going to have a nice letter of explanation. You're not going to misrepresent. You're not going to, you're going to disclose it up front. You know, you're going to show your travel itinerary. You're going to explain you were teleworking, have vacation. You're going to explain everything up front to the visa officer, right? And hope that when they assess on their own merits, when they have all the information that they will allow you to claim the CC work experience. But, you know, if you, if you don't have to rush your express entry application, why would you take the risk, right? Why would you risk it being rejected when you can just wait three months, continue working inside Canada, and then off you go. All right, Lucas says, my CRS score is 477. I'm studying to French to bump up to 524 in hopes to get an IT under FSW. Yeah, is this a valid plan? Yeah, so you, you can get points. Keep in mind, you can also get those, get 25 points for French. You can obviously also get, um, you know, 50 points for French. Um, you're also going to get points, uh, you know, more points because you have those language points as well. So still a valid plan. Um, 477, you might get an ITA, you know, maybe, maybe within the next three months without actually having to study French. Um, so still a valid plan. I know that a lot of people did, did this during COVID. And uh, again, we, there's the, how they do the draws. There's no rule uh, saying that they have to do draws. There's no rule about how many people they take. There's none of those rules, right? But what we can take a look at is we can take a look at how many people are inside the pool and how many people are, um, how many people are in the pool and how many people are going to be at the, uh, um, at the cutoff, right? So here we have, so the last cutoff is 490. This is before the ITA, right? So before the ITA at 490, there was here 5,500 people, right? So we're expecting this draw this week to be probably the lowest since COVID, uh, like four, sorry, I shouldn't say lowest since COVID because there's some pretty low scores during COVID, but it's definitely been lowest in, in quite a while since non-specific program draws restarted. So do expect this to be somewhere in the 480, Right, and then so then we're looking at March. In March, we could be breaking, the, we could be in the 470s. So still a valid plan, but you could also get an ITA before you know your you study your French. All right. Already answered this question. Yeah. So co-op term, Ravi, hide your questions. So listen, if it's if it's employee paid, right, FSW, it could count. But what I'm trying to tell you is that you might not need it because you might already have two years of work experience at another job, right? Um, the employer of my primary occupation does not have any online presence. My Google search results, very outdated company website. Will it be an issue during my work verification? Well, keep in mind on, it has to be on that company letterhead and they have to provide more details. You have the email address, phone number, physical location. Some IRCC offices have fraud departments and sometimes immigration officers have time to actually go physically to an office and check the physical premise, right? So if the company doesn't exist, for sure it's gonna be a problem. <laughs> if the company does exist, like they operate, you know, a steel working shop, they just don't have a website and, and whatnot or no social media, right? There's no requirement to have that, but I would just be, you know, make sure you provide everything you required inside the completeness check, right? Completeness check, um, 
read this like super like like I read this super carefully and then proof of work experience i just talked about the the it has to be on a company letterhead but also needs to provide information right so there's no requirement no hard and fast requirement but make sure that you do meet uh, these requirements all right bella says hello is it okay to apply for program stream operator without a high school diploma i have a work permit um generally don't really like these questions because there's many there's a lot of programs in alberta right here you're asking me about possibly right you're possibly asking about six or seven programs um there might be some niche programs some that i'm not necessarily that i that, that i can't necessarily think about off the top of my head right but like your question here you're asking me um let's go here immigrate to alberta so here we're gonna go uh advantage immigration program and then we have here three streams and the streams for entrepreneurs. So seven different programs. I, I, I don't know, you're gonna have to do your own research, unfortunately, but I mean, I, th I think it's generally very difficult to, Im to immigrate to Canada without, without a, a high school diploma. I could be wrong, but it's just very quickly, right? So here's a, here you need, you need at least one of these from a post, from a post-secondary institution, right? Um, or have an ECA, right? So here, you definitely need more than high school. Um, again, this is, might not be useful for more people, so I'm just gonna skip it, but do your own research, right? There's seven programs here. I, I, I can't go through all them, unfortunately. All right. Uh, Elena says, hi, I'm a member of the, the Ukrainian program, Canadian Ukraine authorization, emergency travel. All right, unfortunately, I'm still waiting for answer from a child for his program. Can I get a work permit at airport if I arrive? Can I? get work permit at airport if I arrive after the date of program ending. Uh, but I, I definitely wouldn't try to apply to a program after it's closed, nor try to get a work permit for a program after it ends. I don't know the specifics of your case. I don't know where you are. I don't know what's going. So I'm just gonna be very cautious, but I think as a general information, right? A program is gonna end on a specific date tend to be very, very strict about that program actually ending. So um, I know that the Canadian Bar Association has, I think they, they still have a program for pro bono work where you could speak to a lawyer for free who could help you with your, um, with, with the Ukrainian nationals. So you can actually go here on the CBA website and I am a CBA member and I've done some some free consultations, but I would, I would encourage you to take a look here at the Canadian Bar Association and make a request for pro bono assistance for Ukraine and uh, have someone actually look into your situation and meet with you and get get information, right? And this is what we do in, in paid consultations to really sit down with you and understand, you know, your, your situation. But take a look at this, you can speak to the lawyer for free and uh, definitely consult with uh, with one of our, with a Canadian, Canadian lawyer. All right. If I got my ITA but made a mistake on the day I started my studies when I submitted my info for Express Entry, can I correct on my ETA application or do any letter of explanation? Yeah, it was, I would actually do both, right? So always submit the correct information to IRCC. You find a mistake, you forgot to disclose a refusal, disclose it, no letter of disclose it 100%. Don't continue snowballing the mistakes. Mistakes happen, right? And you can explain it saying, you know, it was a typo or I looked at my transcript that had this date instead of my degree, instead of the ECA, fix it 100%. And I would correct the your application i would also write a letter of explanation as to the date as to what happened right but i definitely would not continue to to snowball to snowball this ravi says my three-month internship was by bank after one year training course by the same bank and two year 10 months in the job same knock how does it stand for crs points yeah so so as we talked about right so experience you gain while a student or federal skilled worker may count for express entry. And in your case, it's gonna bring you from two years to three years. So in your case, it's gonna be quite important, right? So if it's paid, right? It, it, if it's paid and it meets the requirements under the ministerial instructions, it could count. I'm giving you legal advice, right? You can do your own research. Obviously, if you'd like to have a consult with me and me to actually review your reference letter, review your situation, look at, look at, look at your file, right? assess your CRS score, that we need a consultation for that because right now I'm just giving legal information. Look at the eligibility, look at the ministerial instructions uh, and also, or, you know, have us retain us in a consult or we'd love to do the express entry application with you or also just answer your questions. All right, hi Cedric, CBC Ottawa is still in processing CC applications. I heard that many CC applicants submitted a later date were processed and other offices got approved. Yeah, so I think, I think right now it's about three to six months for, for cases for P, for PR applications that were that were submitted after 
after COVID, right? So the specific time where they kind of took old files and that continued and new files are, are continuing with trying to be under six months, right? So um, yeah, from experience, some offices are quicker than others, but three to six months tends to see what we're doing today. Now keep in mind that if we go to the IRCC webpage and actually look at the processing times and we go here to economic immigration and put um, uh, CEC, the, the official time is still going to be about 20 months. But as you said, people have got it quicker. And uh, and, and what we're seeing right now from our current clients is, is, yeah, is about the 20 the 20 months for the processing. Listen, guys, I'm really sorry. I do have to go. I have a call in about five minutes. I know I was late. Uh, I really do apologize um, that I couldn't do the full hour today, but I really hope this was helpful. Um, Wish you, I wish everyone here <laughs> really, really the best. Um, really the best weekend. I'm going to see you next week on another live Q&A. And I'm sorry I can get through all the questions. Uh, if you are, if you do want to speak to me, right, we can share a screen, go over your documents, take a look here at Holf Immigration Law, visit our website, tons of information about immigration, studying, working, business immigration, if you're a business inside Canada and you want to hire foreign workers, and then legal help here on judicial reviews, right? So I'll say this every time, but if you get a refusal, super important to reach out, right? 15 days for inside Canada, 60 days for outside Canada, super, super important. So take a look at our content for misrepresentation, delays, refused applications, everything's on our website and speak to a lawyer at the very, very top right. I am, there we go, <laughs> there I am. All right, guys, have yourself a wonderful week.